This morning, um, our Bible readings are going to be slightly different. Um, I'm going to do four Bible readings. Uh, they are the four commissions that are found in the Gospel and Acts, uh, or in the Gospels and Acts. And I have them actually on the screen for this morning just to help us out a little bit. The first one's quite small because it's quite a big, long commission, um, but the rest you'll see as we go along get a little bit shorter. The first one we find is in Matthew's Gospel. We know this as the Great Commission. And Matthew writes, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Then in Mark's gospel, Mark records a slightly shorter version, and he says, Jesus said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. John then uh, speaks of Jesus visiting them when they were in the upper, or in a, a room in Jerusalem, scared for their lives, and we read, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the door being locked where they were, the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad and they, at the, that when they saw the Lord, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And then Luke records for us in the book of Acts at Jesus' ascension these words. He says, So when, Je when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you restore at this time the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the time or the season that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Amen. And we pray that God would bless to us the reading from his word today. Well, this morning we're considering what is mission or what do we believe about mission. I can remember as a child uh, growing up in my home church over in Druminus, uh, just outside Hamilton's Bond. Whenever mission was mentioned, uh, it was usually to hear about someone in deepest, darkest Africa or way out in the east or in the west sharing the gospel with people who hadn't heard it. Other times uh, when I heard about it as a child, it was about giving money to help missionaries um, to be able to do their work out in these places. To me, it was always something that was a way out there, something that other people did, other Christians did. Some did it, some didn't do it. And it was sort of remote and distant. And so often in the church today, that's sort of the, the image that we have when we talk about mission. I wonder this morning, what is your understanding of mission or missions or missionaries? Really, mission is so much more than what's out there and what some people are doing. Sadly, however, as I read through countless authors this week, they all say the same thing. The church in the West has lost what mission really is is and our role in it. So what then is mission? Well, mission is the, comes from the Latin word mito, which means to send. But then there's questions that come from that. Who are we to send? Where are we to send them? What are they to do when they actually get to where they're sent? And probably more importantly, how does this um, mission fit in with the message of Scripture and our role in mission? The reality is mission is one of the biggest themes in all of Scripture. Many talk of the mission of God, which is the mission of the church. Ultimately, when we boil mission down to what has happened, what God is seeking to do in His mission, in His sending, His mission is about worship of Jesus. The goal of mission is the global worship of Jesus Christ by his redeemed people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. The outcome of mission is that all people will delight to praise Jesus. And the motivation for mission 
is the enjoyment that his people have with him and in him. Mission aims at, it brings about, and it is fueled by the worship of Christ. But how do we fit into that? C.H. Spurgeon uh, once said in one of his sermons, and it's a phrase that has challenged me all week, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. Every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. The truth is, at the moment that we are called by God into His family, we become a missionary. The God who calls us to Himself now sends us in His name on His mission to declare Christ and to see people worship His Son. But what does it actually look like? What does it mean for us to live as missionaries? Well, in the time that we've got together this morning, I want to unpack the four commissions from the Great Commission, about what we believe about Christ, or about mission itself. And to do that, I have four points that I want to take from these four passages. And the first thing that we need to see as we unpack mission is that we must ask the question, well, who is sent? If mission is about sending, then who is the one that's sent? The answer is, we are all sent. Hopefully that'll come up. There we go. From the birth of the church, we are told to go. The church was never called to sit still and wait for people to come to them. It has always been called to go. When you look at the Great Commissions, Matthew starts with, go therefore. Mark, go into. Jesus, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. We are called to go. And that requires effort. It means to go where people are at. It means, not to, it means that we're not to hide behind the doors of the church and, and wait for someone to maybe walk in. If someone walked in off the street out here, we would start to wonder how they firstly got there all the way out here into the middle of the countryside. But Spurgeon was right when he said that every Christian is supposed to be a missionary because we are the sent ones, sent on God's mission. The reason that churches die is not because the gospel is not being preached. It's at most of the time, it's because the church never goes beyond the threshold of the door. They get to the door and, of the church building and they leave their faith there with their hymn book or behind in the seat with their announcements. And it's hidden away until they re-enter the building where they feel safe and secure the next week. God is not asking us to do anything he hasn't done himself. Jesus is God's sent one. He is the ultimate supreme apostle. He came from heaven to earth. All he's asking us to do is to go out into our community. When we talk about mission, about being sent, it doesn't mean that we go off to a foreign country. It doesn't mean we go on a summer camp. It means that we are to daily go in His name into our community, into our workplace, and with our families. So often the church can look at the account and acts of the Great Commission, and we skip the first bit. It says, you will be my witnesses in Samaria and the rest of the world, and we forget about Jerusalem and Judea. We are called to be missionaries on our own doorstep, with the neighbor that we see every single day, with the work colleague who sits opposite us, or the family friend or a family member that we meet for coffee or meet up with for dinner. And the truth is that we're not going to be a missionary. If, if we're not going to be a missionary to them, then what Spurgeon says is right. If we're not a missionary, then we're an imposter to the name of Christ Jesus. Because Christ is the one who was sent by God who now sends us. Something I heard this week, I was listening to a sermon by R.C. Sproul, and he talked about the, so often within the church at large in the West, many people will believe in God, but very few believe God. And there is a massive difference in those two. To go from believing in God to believing God Himself is where it goes from the head to the heart. And when it does that, we will seek then to serve Him in His mission. So firstly, when we look at mission, we are told that we 
are sent. We're sent as missionaries into every part of our daily lives. But secondly, we must see who we are sent to. We're told that we are sent to all people, sent to be part of the world. And that's where we have to look secondly, the sent to all people. I, I'm always amazed by the story of a woman named Elizabeth Elliot. She was the great missionary wife of Jim Elliot. Now, for those of you who have never heard of either of those people, Jim Elliot was an American missionary who, in the 50s, along with four, four other missionaries, went to a group, a tribe in Ecuador. And they went to share Christ with them. However, sadly, all five were killed before they got into the main village by the tribe, and it was due to miscommunication. Afterwards, Elizabeth went back to the same tribe, and she continued to minister to that tribe who had killed her husband. She raised her daughter in the midst of that group. Some who were converted through her ministry babysat her daughter, the same people who had killed that child's father. Rachel Saint, one of the other missionary wives of those five, went as well. She worshipped in the church where some of those that were standing with her and worshipping with her were the very ones who had murdered her husband. Those women went to the people who had taken everything from them because they wanted to share Christ with them, to fulfill the commission that God gives us, to see people brought into God's family. We are called in the Great Commission to go to all people, all nations. And Elizabeth is a great example of crossing that painful barrier to go to people that we would not normally go to. And I wonder, do we have the same heart? Do we have the same passion for the lost? Not just that Elizabeth had, but also that Christ himself had. Christ came to those who rebelled against him, who rejected him, who ultimately killed him. And he came to seek and save the lost. I'm always driven in my ministry by the story that I've told on a number of occasions by D.L. Moody, or about D.L. Moody. But I think it fits so well when we're talking here about mission. When D.L. Moody was in London during one of his famous evangelistic tours, several British clergymen went to visit him. They kind of went to be a bit nosy. They wanted to know how and why this poorly educated American was so effective in winning throngs of people for Christ. Moody took the three men over to a window in his hotel, and he asked them in turn to say what they saw. And they described the scene in the park below. But then Moody looked out the window himself with tears rolling down his cheek. And one of them asked Mr. Moody, what do you see? And he said these famous words. Hopefully they'll come up on the screen. I see countless thousands of souls that will one day spend an eternity in hell if, we, if they do not find the Savior. I will see countless thousands of souls that will one day spend an eternity in hell if they do not find a Savior. Do we see the same? In this world, there are only two types of people. There are those who God has already graciously saved, and there are those that are lost. And we are called to go to those who are lost. And that is a big challenge. But if we are called to be missionaries to all people, that means going to them regardless of what they have done or who they are. We all bleed exactly the same. The reality is God was willing and gracious enough to save each one of us. What right do we have to demand of him and say to him, I will not go to those people? We have no right at all. 
The reality is we are called to go to all people. And that in itself is a challenge, but it's one that we must fulfill. Because the reality is those words of DL, that countless thousands of souls will one day spend an eternity in hell. That is separation from God. That is eternal torment. If they do not find a Savior, God has been gracious enough to save us. Why would we deny anybody that when we didn't deserve it ourselves? So we're called to go to all people. But what are we to do when we actually get there? The reality is, thirdly, we are, may, we are called to make disciples. We are called, we are sent to make disciples. Recently in our new members class, uh, I asked those that were there, what was more important? Was it to live a godly life among the people that we interact with daily, or was it to proclaim the gospel to them and preach it to them? The reality is that, that both those things are highly important. But one should always lead to the other and not the other way around. What do I mean? Well, in the Great Commission in Acts, we are told to be witnesses. And then we are told in Mark's or Matthew's gospel to make disciples. But there are two ways in which that works. One is to witness among them. And two is then to teach them and to tell them and proclaim the gospel. But firstly, we're called to witness to show what Christ has done in our lives through how we interact with them, how we care for them, how we love them. People will, far quicker, will, will, will read us far quicker than they will read the Bible. And if we are not being a missionary, if we are not living out what God has done in our lives, then we're an imposter. There should be a change in our lives. Something that makes us stand up and be different. Our lives are to reflect what we profess with our lips. The question is, does it? When we go out among our friends and our family, are we setting a Christian example? Are we living the way Christ calls us to live? When we go into the workplace or into school, do we show respect to authority? Do we not enter into gossip because that is damaging to people? Are we seeking to encourage our work colleagues, our school friends, those that we associate with? Are we seeking to intentionally build relationships with people so that we may have an opportunity to share Christ with them? And then when the opportunity presents itself, taking that and telling them about Christ But notice something here. We're called to make disciples, not converts. We're not called to give people a golden ticket to paradise and then leave them to do nothing about it. That only creates imposters. We are seeking to make disciples. We're seeking to make learners, as we ourselves should be. And the reality is this takes time. If we go to make something, be it any type of food or craftsmanship, it takes time. And the reality is, it means that it won't appear instantly. We live in a generation where everything must be instant. The reality is, to make a disciple takes time. That's why uh, something that drives me totally bonkers as a minister is people who stand on the street corner and shout the gospel at them. You must be saved. You must repent. That makes no impact. Actually, that turns people off. Because there's no relationship built there. People will first will come to Christ because they first trust the person that showed them what Christ has done in their life. And that will take time. Time invested in people's lives time to help them grow. And the wonderful thing is that God has already given us everything we need in His Word to take the message to them. We are called to take that message that Christ came into the world to save sinners and to seek to bring us back into relationship with Himself. And we do that with other, we show that to other people by firstly living like that among them, that Christ has made the difference in us. And then we help them to come to faith in Christ. 
We are to make them disciples in the ways of God. And not just to believe that there is a God or believe in God, but to believe God, to trust in Him and what Christ has done for them. But it means that we've got to be intentional, both individually in our relationships with others, but also we need to be intentional in our church family, in what we are doing. What do I mean? Well, recently I was at a conference, and the speaker there was Rico Tice. Rico is the rector for evangelism and all souls in London, and also the head of Christianity Explored Ministries. And he said a statement that sort of was a by the by, but it's something that has challenged me ever since. And this was the statement that he came out with. Are we doing church work, or are we doing the work of the church? Now, what does he actually mean by that? Well, what he was getting at is that the church can be so busy doing church work, running organizations, running uh, program, all sorts of programs, getting bogged down with administrative work, doing things in order to keep its members busy and out of trouble, creating our own little clubs. And as a result, the church is no longer doing the work of the church. The work of the church is to go and make disciples of all nations. That is what we are here to do as God's family, as we fellowship together and we build God's kingdom with his help. The question is, are we actually doing that? Or is our church program so geared towards just keeping our members happy and doing things out of tradition that we're not willing to put effort in to do something about seeing the lost saved, seeing the lost made into disciples? We are called to go and make disciples of all nations, to tell them the wonderful realities of Christ and his cross and salvation in him and the relationship we can have with him. But are we doing that individually, and are we doing that as a church? These are the questions we've got to ask ourselves. Are we actually fulfilling the work of the church, or are we just doing church work to keep ourselves busy until Christ comes back? It is a big challenge in and of itself. And the reality is that the task that lies before us is a huge one. But we do not go alone. The last part of, of Acts uh, and Matthew's gospel in terms of the um, Great Commission tells us that we are not sent alone. We are not sent alone. Acts 1 and verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Matthew twenty-eight twenty, And behold, I am with you always to the end of of the age. I remember when I was training for ministry, uh, way back when I was in Cornhill over six years ago. And I remember Rico Tice meeting him for the first time. This man amazed me because he just bounced everywhere. He had such a passion for the lost. But he, remind, he kept getting us to repeat something that had to be ingrained inside us. It's the only thing that helps me to sleep at night, to be truthfully honest. And it is that, that we preach Christ. and God opens blind eyes. We are called to go to all people. We are called to stick our neck on the line, to make disciples, to teach them about Christ and to live a godly life among them. But in the end, it is God who saves. He is the one that opens blind eyes. He opened our eyes so that we could trust in him and he will do the same to others. And he uses us as his instruments, as his children, to go faithfully with the power of his Spirit to preach Christ, to proclaim his truths, and to know that we have a God who will never leave us or put us where his grace cannot keep us. We may find ourselves in difficult situations as we seek to be missionaries for God, as we seek to be a missionary to all those around us, to minister to our families is the hardest thing we can do. But he promises us that he will never leave us. He's the one that's at work. And it should give us this reality that we are not afraid. 
that we have nothing to fear because He is with us. And it should inspire us to go no matter what. That hymn we sung just before the sermon, facing a task unfinished that drives us to our knees, a need that undiminished rebukes our slothful ease. We're called to go in the name of Christ and to proclaim His gospel. It will drive us to our knees because if we have a passion for the lost as Christ had, it will call us to rely on God day by day to give us the strength to live as missionaries in the world around us. But the great thing is, He is completing His mission, and He delights to use us in it. And He will bring it to completion when Christ returns. And the great thing is, until then, we are not sent alone. We always have Him with us. So as I close on what we believe about mission. Our mission is to go into all the world, to all people, and make disciples. To witness among them and to teach them of Christ and His ways. But we are to know as we go that we have a God who saves. And we have a God who goes with us and helps us to proclaim that wonderful truth. But as I leave us today, I want to leave us with two challenges from quotes that I've already put on the screen. And the first one is that of D.L. I see countless thousands of souls that will one day spend an eternity in hell if they do not find a Savior. Do we see as He saw? Do we see as Christ continues to see? God has been gracious enough to save each one of us that has come to the Lord. Why would we ever, ever consider that we are more worthy than anyone else to receive that grace? There are countless thousands of souls out there that still need to hear the gospel. And each one of us may be the only person, only Christian they ever interact with. Do we see as they saw and seek to share that message with them. Because without Christ, they will spend eternity in hell. And then that quote from C.H. Spurgeon. And it's probably the biggest challenge that I've faced this week as I've thought through mission. Every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. To be a Christian means to be a missionary. Which one are we? Are we the Christian who is a missionary or the imposter claiming the name of Christ? May God help us to fulfill our mission, to see souls won for Christ as we live for Him in the mission field.